This video will discuss what happens when we take some trial wave function and then do functional variation to find the minimum in energy with respect to variations in the wave function. So this exercise is going to be very similar to what we do in the sort of linear variational method, but just with a slightly different flavor, although we'll see end up seeing a very similar result. So let's imagine that we start off with some trial wave function. I might call this like capital phi tilde, for example. So our energy is actually a functional of this trial wave function. So functional being it just depends on uh, where what the value of it is in all coordinates at all times uh, for what its value is. And that energy is equal to the following expectation value integral. It's the complex conjugate of the wave function times the Hamiltonian operator acting on the wave function, just as it is for all of quantum mechanics, even though I've used a fancy script H because, I don't know, I'm feeling fancy here. Okay, so we have this expectation value, and then of course that's integrated over all space. That would be all coordinates of all electrons in this case, uh, both their spatial part, x, y, and z, and their spin part, omega. So E, as I mentioned, is a functional of our trial wave function. It depends on what the value of that wave function is at all 3n or 4n coordinates, uh, the spatial and spin parts of every electron. So let's define the following thing. Let's say that our trial wave function is going to become a trial wave function plus some small variation here. You could imagine this like calculus in terms of uh, the first variation being similar to like the first derivative, like a dx, some very small step in any particular direction in which we can alter this function. So then what is the energy of this new uh, first variation in our wave function? Well, that'll be the energy of the original wave function plus the change in that wave function. So that means we have our expectation value integral being um, substituting in our new wave function in each side of the bracket. And if we then split out the four terms that result, uh, the first term is going to be actually this term here. So we just get E of the original wave function, which makes sense. That's going to be the starting point of where we go from when we, when we make some variation. Um, the next term, or the next two terms you might say, uh, would be a term like this, a term like that, where we have one of the cases is going to be a varia the, the variation in the wave function, and the other is going to be the wave function itself, um, switch, flipping on, on the sides of which one is the complex conjugate or not. Okay, so we have those two terms. And then lastly, the term we have is where it's variations on both sides. And we're not going to include that term because we're going to view that term as a second order term uh, if you go back and looking at the kind of nomenclature we use for perturbation theory. So this is a first order term because we have one thing which is a variation and is very small in change relative to the original wave function. But when we use uh, variations on both the complex conjugate and the wave function, then that's a second order variation because both of them are, are varying. And the result of that should be quite small compared to these first order terms. So that gives us our zero order term, which is the energy of the original wave function, plus a first order term, which is these two terms, and then plus uh, higher order terms that we're not going to concern ourselves with after that, the second order and beyond. Okay, so our task then is to find the minimum energy where, which is going to be found whenever the variation in the energy is equal to zero with respect to the variations in the wave function. Okay, so to do this, we're going to simplify further and assume that <clears throat> we are using some wave function, which is a linear combination of some basis set. So for example, our wave function here might be a sum over k basis functions of some coefficient times the ith basis function as we're going along this sum. So we have that. These might be, you know, different determinants. These might be, you know, what, what have you, some different way of expressing our wave function in terms of some basis set. All right, so then our energy 
um, is going to be the same expectation value integral as we've been seeing thus far. But when we substitute in this form for the wave function, and similarly for the complex conjugate, where we have the star for the coefficient and uh, using the bra instead of the ket, then we're going to get a sum i equals 1 to k, where we have uh, sum the bra side, ci star times psi i star, and then the ket side, sum j equals 1 to k of cj psi j for the ket. And then and then we just have to figure out what all the expectation value integrals are for basis function i interacting with the Hamiltonian operator acting on basis function j integrated over all space. All right, so we are going to minimize our energy here, uh, but there is an additional constraint we need to worry about. We need, the, we need our wave function to remain normalized as we do these variations. So we know that the integral of psi star psi over all space according to quantum mechanics should be one. There should be a 100% chance of finding the system in some state once we integrate over all the, all the variables there. So we're going to enforce that by using uh, a Lagrangian for this. So if you are uh, not familiar from calculus or you don't remember this part of calculus in terms of uh, Lagrangians or Lagrange multipliers. You can use those terms and look that up. So we're basically going to define our expectation value for the for the energy minus a Lagrange multiplier, which in this case I'm going to call E, times our uh, overlap of our wave function with itself, which in principle should be 1, and then we're going to subtract 1 from that as well. So what this does is this gives us a penalty that if we get, if our energy is decreasing due to the non-normalization of the wave function, this term is going to cancel out in an equal and opposite way any decreases in energy which are solely due to uh, non-normalization at this point. Okay, so taking these terms and substituting in what we've uh, discovered thus far, we get a double sum over i and j for all basis functions, ci star, cj, uh, and then this uh, matrix element, psi i star, h psi j. And then we subtract from that the energy times, and then substituting in the basis set expansion uh, for these two terms, gonna give a similar double sum. Sum over i and j for all basis functions, ci star, cj, overlap integral of basis function i and j, minus one for each of those terms. So then we're going to take the first variation of these terms that we got here. So that variation is going to look like uh, the following. So we're going to have a sum over i and j. As we saw, each of these terms it falls within some sum over i, j of. So there's going to be a couple different terms here. We're going to have uh, the terms for the first part here where we could vary ci or we could vary cj. So delta ci star or delta cj, keeping the same terms there otherwise from the sort of the product rule from calculus. And then on the other side of that, we have ci and cj here as well. So product rule, we could either vary ci or we could vary cj. So we have one term with delta ci star and the other term with delta cj. And the way I've factored these here is such that uh, we have one term up at the top here, and we have essentially its complex conjugate down here, uh, where we have um, it, we have essentially what is what is going to be pretty much the same term if you if you swap the different labels and take the complex conjugate. So it's really um, either one of these being zero is going to be sufficient enough for us to get the the result that we need of this whole term being equal to zero. All right, so then we can define, as I've been hinting, the matrix H, where we're going to define all of these matrix elements, psi i, h, psi j. Um, and then we're going to find the overlap matrix S, uh, where its elements, s, i, j, are the overlap integral of, of basis function i and basis function j. So once we do that, and we kind of simplify our terms here, we note that we have delta ci star in both of the cases up here. So we have delta ci star 
uh, sum over j, h i j c j minus e s i j c j, once I factored out the sum over i to be on the outside. And similarly, factoring the bottom in, the, in a similar kind of way, I get a sum over j, delta c j, sum over i, h i j c i star, minus e s i j c i star. And both of those terms have to be equal to zero, but as you can see, there's quite a corresponding symmetry in terms of the uh, complex conjugates of one another. And these are both going to be Hermitian matrices, so that's going to help us out quite a bit even more. So the result is that in order for this entire term to be equal to zero, each of them individually needs to be equal to zero. And our coefficients, or the variation in the coefficients, isn't necessarily going to be equal to zero. So what needs to be z equal to zero is the terms within the parentheses here. And within the parentheses here, these terms are going to be equal to zero if the left term is equal to the right term. They will cancel each other out and thus give us zero. So uh, doing that math and getting the result, we have the sum over j, h i j c j, equals e sum over j, s i j c j. And this has to be true for all of the different i's and j's that you can imagine here, um, all the way from 1 to k. And so expressed in matrix form, you'll note that this expression here is sort of similar to a matrix vo vector multiplication, as is this uh, ex example here. So this is equal to the Hamiltonian matrix H acting on the coefficient vector C of our entire basis set equaling the energy times the overlap matrix uh, acting on our coefficient vector C. So it's in fact C which represents sort of the um, C which represents the ideal minimum energy uh, set of coefficients for our basis set, H being the Hamiltonian matrix and uh, E being the energy of that system, S being the overlap matrix of all of our basis functions. And in fact, in the special case where S is an identity matrix, the case where we have an orthonormal basis set, where these overlap elements are 1 if i equals j, and they're 0 if i is not equal to j, then in that special case we have HC equals EC, and we actually just have the eigenvalue uh, matrix form of the, of the Schrodinger equation. So that is all to say that this type of procedure we can see gives us a completely analogous result to what happened in the linear variational method in the quantum chemistry playlist. So when we use this moving forward for the particular case of hartree fock we should trust that it's going to give the same result as any kind of linear variational method would have for ensuring that the result we get is actually the minimum energy uh, wave function with respect to all of our uh, coefficients of our basis set, which we know back from the variational principle in the quantum chemistry chapter, that that means we have the best possible approximation uh, to our true wave function and true system energy.